that section, you're going to be answering these questions. Okay, so these are going to be what you're filling in and we'll kind of try to point to them when we're answering right. that question in the presentation. But I think that this will be a little bit more kind of what you're used to as far as following along. And then you'll have these two questions that kind of wrap up the end once we get through what happens in these next uh, set of battles, okay? So, and just like yesterday, when your position gets called to make a decision, you're filling out this day two simulation decision form. Okay, so it's the same thing that you'll do. You'll still only be able to get two points, but this time you'll, you know, um, you have a better idea of like when you're supposed to fill it out. So I really like that I see that nobody's turned it in yet. That's what it should look like. All right. So let's get going on today then. So I would suggest having split screen up with our meet in one side so you can see the presentation and your guided notes in the other. And then if you wanna have the Google form up for whenever you have to fill it in as well, that's probably a wise choice. Right. All right, let's get to it. <laughs> Everything good? Yeah, spam. All right, so the battles of Trenton and Princeton. You probably have heard of the Battle of Trenton without really having ever known what it was. Um, and that's because one of the most famous pictures of George Washington, where he's on the boat, you know, arm up, leading his men, floating we had on this. It in your classroom. We had it in your classroom last year, all last quarter. Yep. Uh, yeah, it's, I still think it is my header. Yeah, going, going across the Delaware uh, River, that is him leading to the Battle of Trenton. So you do kind of, you probably at least have heard of it, but just didn't know what it was. Most people think it's Valley Forge because mm -hmm. it's so cold. So a lot of you guys are right on with the bell work. After this New York campaign, where basically Washington just keeps losing, retreating, losing, retreating, losing supplies, losing men. Morale is low amongst soldiers. We have Nathan Hale kind of as our martyr, which gives us a little bit of a boost, but the overall feeling going into this first winter of the war is it's not looking good. It's not looking good at all. We can't seem to win anything. We don't have the supplies that we need and really kind of questioning how great this George Washington is. That's really where the Americans are at this point. But the British is a completely different story. General Howe, who's been leading a lot of these um, major battles in the New York area, he is extremely happy with his success. He actually is predicting that once the winter is over and we start engagements again in the spring, I'll just have a couple engagements and then we are like gonna get out of here like this is gonna be easy he's even left trenton new jersey which is pretty close to washington's army to retreat back into a more comfortable manhattan area and he leaves the hessians those german soldiers in trenton new jersey now Another side story here is Cornwallis, who, if you watch The Patriot, Cornwallis is the major um, general. He's really kind of the, you know, renowned British general with the white hair and the... typical, Yeah. The character you don't like. Yeah. He has, he's literally packing his bags right now, about to head back to England because he's like, ah, how you can handle this if you need me, call me, but... I'm getting out of here. We're, this, this war is over. This is how confident the British are feeling after this first year of the war. Whereas, obviously, we don't feel the same. We're, we're pushed back into a camp in Pennsylvania. It's winter. We don't have supplies. We don't have a win to even reminisce on besides Lexington and Concord. I mean, it's just, it's just all around. Not a good look for the... For, 
Washington and his, and his army right now. And not only that, we're about a couple days away from most of our soldiers' enlistments being up. And when that happens, when you've served your enlistment, you've served your contract, you're good to go home. It's January is when most of them are up, and there is no way. Washington knows this, the feeling in the camp. There's no way these men are going to stick around if he doesn't get a win. He knows he needs this win more than anything. And something else he needs is a spy. Remember, Washington totally relies on these spies, but it's still early in the war. It's hard to know where loyalties lie. So spies, you've got a decision to make. We're going to look at your decision. So if you're a spy, you're opening up number 19 right now. You're going to start filling out the form, making your decision. We have this man, John Honeyman, and he is a butcher from New Jersey who's kind of wandering and snooping on the outskirts of, of the camp. He says when he's confronted that he is spying on the Hessian soldiers for George Washington. However, we do know everybody's got to be kind of taken with a grain of salt because we don't know where everybody's loyalties lie. This could be a double agent here. Trying to sound like he's spying for Washington when really he's just a British loyalist. So you've got two choices that you're going to make spies. Are you going to trust this guy that he's telling the truth, take him to Washington, and let Washington decide? Or... Are you going to immediately lock him up? I mean, you saw how mad um, you saw how mad Washington got at the officers that kind of questioned him and stuff and wasted his time yesterday. So, are you going to make the decision to lock up Honeyman? He seems super sus. Why are you like just kind of roaming around our camp? Sounds like you're just trying to see what we're up to. We found so many traitors at this point; it's hard to trust anybody. So tell me what you're going to choose. Are you going to choose A or are you going to choose B? Even if you're not a spy, you can put in the chat what, what's the decision that you would make. Let's see what happens. If you chose to trust him, this is a good decision. He actually is working for Washington. Now, you're not going to know it at the time because pretty much nobody knew that Honeyman was actually a spy for Washington. But the fact that you give him over to Washington without just throwing him in jail is a great decision. Because he's going to give some really good insight that the Hessians are busy, you know, celebrating Christmas. And they are not even thinking that there is an attack coming. And also... He's been giving intel to the Hessians that um, the Americans are too defeated to even gather up the strength to, for any type of battle. So they're, they're safe. So the British think they can trust him, but really he's kind of an American guy. Now, if you chose to, you know, say kind of just throw him right into jail, without letting Washington know you think you're doing the right thing because everybody's a little suspect, but Washington's kind of just angry that you haven't let him know. You need to let him make the decisions. So you've definitely lost some morale points because now Washington's mad at you and you've learned your lesson. Trust George Washington. For those of you that are filling in the Google Slides, this is what you're going to go with. This is what actually happens. And this John Honeyman is really an interesting guy because he is a British, former British soldier. He came to the Americas to serve in the British Army years ago. Got kind of salty with them. <coughs> crossed paths with George Washington. And they developed a really good, you know, connection. And Honeyman has decided he wants to help the Patriot cause. And so Washington trusts this man. And this man says, hey, I am like the perfect double agent here. 
because they already trust me. I'm a butcher. I can just be a butcher for the British. I'll be able to spy on their plans. They'll trust me because, I mean, why would I come to America to become a patriot, you know? I came right. to America to serve in the Brit British Army. So he makes really the perfect, this kind of double agent where the British think they can trust him, but the Americans are really the ones that can trust him. So he gives Washington this intel that, yeah, the Hessians totally unprepared. It's Christmas holiday. They love celebrating Christmas. And you'll be able to waltz right in and take over. And then I have been telling them that you are, like, super defeated. And there's no way you could possibly attack them. So he's trying to assure the, the uh, Hessians that you got nothing to worry about. While at the same time telling Washington, no, you totally need to get over there. They're, like, not even expecting it. Mm. And so one interesting thing that Washington does is when his men do bring Honeymoon or Honeyman to the um, to the camp to confront Washington, Washington interrogates him as if he's a traitor or as if he's, you know, a, a British spy. And then he sends all of the officers out and he talks to Honeyman for an hour. And nobody really knows what happened in that meeting. But what we do know is Washington now has the insight of what was happening over in the Hessian camp. He walks out, he locks him in the jail, and then the next day, Honeyman is free. It is reported that Washington gave Honeyman the key so that he could escape and still be able to save face with the British because obviously the British would know that if we just let him go, that he's working for us. But if he escaped from the jail, he's now able to look like, you know, he got caught and then he had to escape himself and he's still working with the British. He will end up going home with his family and he's kind of an unsung hero of the American Revolution. But this is kind of Washington's genius of I'm not I don't even want my officers to know that this guy is really working with me. And I want to protect him so that he's not a target to the British anymore. All the while right. taking this information and devising this plan. He meets with his officers and says, Christmas Day, Trenton, New Jersey, we're going. We're going to send our entire army across the freezing Delaware River. Then we're going to march 19 miles into Trenton. We're going to take the town of Trenton. It's just the win we need going into, you know, the year. So, officers, you've got a decision to make. You pull up your Google form. You're pulling up number 19 if you're an officer. And here's the scenario that you're in. Washington has just told you this crazy plan. It's There's going to be a storm on this night when you've got to make the decision to go, you're literally putting your men in boats in the middle of the night. There's ice in this river. It's so cold. And you know that most of your men can't swim. So if you're overpacked in these boats, surely men are gonna fall overboard. We've seen it happen before. So you've got a decision to make. Are you going to follow Washington's orders and cross the Delaware and if, you know what, if a man goes overboard, the blood's on Washington's hands. That's not his, that's not right. his fault. You're following your orders, you trust Washington, or or what? What are you going to do? Your other option is you're going to stand up to Washington. You're going to say, no, it is not worth risking this man's life on Christmas Day. In the middle of a storm. Let's just wait at least for the storm to pass. At the minimum, let's wait for the storm to pass. Because can you imagine if we lose men and we lose this battle, there's no chance we'll convince them to stay. So is it really worth the risk? So you're making this decision here. So it seems like a lot of you guys are, are choosing A. Although I'll admit that this officer has a pretty good argument. Could you imagine if we lose this? So here's the scenarios. If you chose to follow the orders and you go ahead and cross, 
great decision. This ends up being a pretty big turning point in the war because we're going to win. We're going to win in Trenton, New Jersey. We're going to take hostages. This is good. This is going to be a good thing for the army. So you're high on points, high on supply points. This was a great decision, all you guys that chose A. If you chose B, as that's noble, you are looking out for your men and you're looking out for the overall cause. You just don't realize how desperate times are because there's no way Washington knows there's no way I can just go without winning any battles and expect these men to re-enlist. So you do get to reap the benefits of these supplies. And, you know, it's kind of like when your team wins the championship, but you stayed home. Like, yay, it's exciting, but you weren't there. Right. So your morale's not like super high, but it's definitely not as low as it was. And so many trusted Washington. So you've got to, as an officer, think about that and what you're bound to legally as an officer. So when it comes to the day, they leave on Christmas night so that they'll make it to the camp the day after Christmas or that morning after Christmas. Crossing the Delaware is tough. We are gonna lose two men to hypothermia from either falling out and you know coming back in and just not having the proper you know equipment. And I mean it's raining, snowing, it's not a great, not a great feel. The main group is led by Washington, they cross the river. Now, it's very unlikely he would be standing on any of those boats because that would be very dangerous to do, but it does make for a really great picture. Hmm. Meanwhile, back at the Hessian camp. Now, this is a little bit of urgent legend, urban legend. There's no technical evidence that the Hessians were hammered from the night before or hungover. Yeah, they're but up there at Christmas party. But they were German, and the stereotype of Germans is they enjoy drinking. So we do make the assumption, especially based on their actions, they were not ready for it. This colonel, John Rawl, he's given intel from a loyalist that Washington's army has just crossed the Delaware. He doesn't read it. He doesn't open it. He puts it in his pocket. He finds it after the battle. So maybe just an oversight. Maybe he was just enjoying celebrating too much. There is also when Washington comes in, he surrounds them on two sides. And there is technically a way that they could have gotten out. But all the soldiers were so confused and in disarray that they end up surrendering to Washington and his army. So we can say we don't have evidence that maybe parting had a little bit to do with this the outcome of this but if we put that evidence together it's pretty compelling evidence that they might have been a little um a little loose still maybe <laughs> so he leads the attack we win it's a decisive victory we barely lose any soldiers barely anybody is wounded we capture at least a thousand hessians and best of all all of their supplies, which was what we needed so bad. So soldiers, you're left to a decision now. Go ahead, Autumn. What was the person's name that tried to send the message or something? He's just a loyalist. He was just a town loyalist that saw the, um, the group crossing and wanted to let the Hessians know, but you know. Okay, thank you. I get through. You're good. That's probably a question a lot of people had. They have it last period too. All right, so soldiers, here's your dilemma. Your enlistment ex expires in a few days. You have to sign up for minimum at least another six months. Are you gonna do it? Or are you going to say, yes, this win at Trenton was nice, but I am ready to get home. I'm sick of being cold. I'm sick of not having supplies. I did not sign up for this. So you can either serve the rest of your time and then return home. Yeah, the win at Trenton was great, but okay, 
yeah, it's not enough to keep me away. Or you can choose to re-enlist for at least another six months. This one actually gives you hope that freedom is attainable. So tell us what you're choosing. Are you going to go with A or B? Are you going to go home or are you going to re-enlist? I think I have a feeling what you guys are going to choose. If people aren't soldiers, can they answer? Yeah, you can put it in the chat. All right. Got a, some re-enlisting. Some people are ready to go home. I totally get that. I don't even actually go camping. I go camping in a camper, so I couldn't imagine being cold, intense all winter. All right, let's see what the consequence of those choices are. If you choose to serve your final days and go home, you're going to be very disappointed because here in January, on January 3rd, we're going to get yet another W. And we are uh, kind of on our high horse going into the spring of 1777. So, yes, you're home, you get to be with your family, but it's going to be hard to um, accept how well the Army's doing without you. Especially back then, I was like a shot at your pride. But those of you that re-enlisted, you did what pretty much all the soldiers did. You re-enlist, you're super motivated by this win, you're really starting to trust Washington and all his decisions. And it's like you can start to taste the freedom. Because sometimes that's all it takes is one big win for that hope that, hey, we've got a chance. So your morale and your supply points are off the charts. So those of you guys that are filling in the notes, if you're not a soldier, this is what really happened. It's going to be kind of this two-part Thing, how we kind of respond to the win. Washington is no longer going to be viewed as a losing general. This is when we start to see this shift to him being more of a hero. And he's going to continue to prove himself. But this decision was not one that was like guaranteed. There's no like rule book for this. He did this because he felt it was the best choice. And he's starting to now be seen as a great leader. And we're talking in Congress, they were, they were talking about replacing Washington. So this was so needed, not only for himself, but for the soldiers. Almost every soldier is going to re-enlist. Their faith has been restored. They've got the resources they need now that they've taken from the Hessians. And then you're going to start to get support from the other colonies. Because now it seems like, oh, like that's a pretty big deal. You just took back the city of Trenton. That's a big deal. Sometimes that boost of confidence helps you win a war. Yeah, it's most of the soldiers are going to choose to re-enlist, Sean. And now on to Princeton. So Corwin Wallace, who I talked about earlier, who is packing his stuff about to go to England, Here's of the events at Trenton, and he is furious. He's like, nope, we can't wait. I can't trust how. I am going to march into Trenton with my 5,000 soldiers, and we're going to put this thing to rest. So he gets there about January 2nd. He sends his guards down to the Delaware winter, or River so that he's able to watch these colonists to make sure, these Continental Army members, to make sure that they don't try to leave because he's heard what happened at Long Island. He's not about to let Washington just escape again. Remember what I tell you Washington was good at. He devises a plan to get out of Trenton because Washington has also learned from his mistakes. He knows he cannot win major battles where the British have a bunch of their soldiers. He knows he's gonna have to start settling for these small engagements that are very strategic that he can win. And this is not one of them. 5,000 soldiers with General Cornwallis is a losing battle, literally. 
But he also knows that, A, the British are going to be on to us because we did kind of, you know, escape out of Long Island a couple months ago. So he's got to be even better at planning. What was whose name, Sean? Cornwallis is the general. Oh, thank you. That's what he's talking about, yeah. You got to watch The Patriot, man. You'll love that character. So here's kid. Washington's plan. He's going to leave 500 or so men at the current camp. These men are tasked with keeping all the fires going to look as if the camp is still being lived in. They're moving around. They're hitting pots and pans. They're laughing. They're, you know, talking. They're trying to make it appear as if the army is still there. Sitting on the other side of the Delaware across from Trenton to make sure that nothing is suspected. And they don't. They believe that those soldiers are still camped up there. Meanwhile, Washington, they, they do this thing. It's called muffling your wagon um, so that you're really quiet. They were putting cloth around the wheels so you didn't get like the creak as they're moving their wagons and supplies. They don't use torches. They don't use anything. They cross over and they go around Cornwallis's army completely undetected. At one point, Washington was as close as 30 yards away from the British. So you can see in this picture how Washington's army, the route Washington's army goes. He literally goes right past Cornwallis's army. They're that quiet and that sneaky because they're distracted by thinking, oh, well, they're all over there in camp. There's no reason why they'd be, you know, anything to worry about. So he's able to get through. And then if you look at this map, he makes this um, move to Sandtown, makes his way up, and he'll end up here in Princeton, New Jersey. Now, here's an issue. One of Cornwallis's regiments is kind of staggering behind, didn't quite keep up with the rest of the full force of the army. And they literally run into Washington. Neither side was ready to fight or thinking they were going to fight. But here a battle breaks out in Princeton, New Jersey, just two weeks after the win at Trenton. And we win. Because it's not the full force. This isn't 5,000 men. This is a much smaller force that the Americans are able to fight. And yes, it's a little bit of luck that they run into them, but they do it. The Patriots get Princeton. They win Princeton. So now we are two for two this winter. Going into 77. The tide seems to be shifting. Even though these are small battles, that doesn't matter to the soldiers. The soldiers won. They feel like they won. And we have really severely angered all of those British generals to where they, they're they like, okay, we got to really start taking this serious again. The tide really seems to be kind of shifting in the Americans' favor. And it's going to cause the British to completely change their strategy, which is going to end up working in our favor. All right, so two of the questions that are kind of wrapping up on your notes are what are the impacts of these battles? And then how have these battles affected people's view on George Washington? And if you've been paying attention, you'll probably answer that pretty easily. But I would say when you come down to the major impact of these battles, it was this, you know, morale is low and it really changes the feeling of the war. It gives those colonists hope. It gives those soldiers hope that we can actually beat the British. We just have to do it on our terms. We've got to be the ones that, you know, pick and choose our battles. No, we're not going to go up against Cornwallis's army every day because it takes one big win, then we got to surrender. It's not worth it. So these battles are really going to, to prove to the soldiers that they can win and prove that, you know, 
the Continentals have to take a little bit of a different strategy. They're going to have to start going with these smaller engagements because they can win those engagements and they're still effective. So at the end of the day, you really just got to wear the British out. They're not going to stay there forever. Right. And the Continentals are starting to realize that. So as far as how do they affect people's view on George Washington, that one should be easy. Restored faith. They feel like he's out. He actually knows what he's doing now. He's kind of proven himself in a sense to not only Congress, not only his officers, but also his men. And that's part of the genius of Washington. It really is. He learns from his mistakes. He surrounds himself with people that know what they're doing. He's really good at these spy rings. <laughs> that really helps him. <laughs> 